Uh, first of all, thank you for having me here. Um, so, to start with, um, I'm going to say that stamps and pintaderas are some of the most visually striking yet enigmatic tools found at Neolithic settlements across the Balkans. While many of these objects have been preserved across different sites, their imprints remain absent from archaeological records. As no materials with stamp impressions appear to have been preserved, I like to think of any archaeologist who studies these artifacts as someone who is examining a tool designed to produce images, a shabby old brush, for example, and trying to determine whether it was used to decorate walls, to sign documents, or perhaps to create bodily decorations. This comparison clearly illustrates the central problem in any study of Neolithic stamps in the Balkans. While many tools have been preserved, their final products are missing. And yet, I'd like to use this opportunity to show that these Neolithic artifacts are far from mute. Rather, they can be seen as animate things imbued with vital materiality and thing power that will, during the course of this talk, begin to tell us a great deal about the relational processes between substances they were made from, their makers, the finished tool and the people who use them, other objects associated with them, the places in which they were used, the images produced with them, and the materials on which they stamped and reproduced geometrical motives. In contrast to traditional archaeological discourse, which portrays stamps as passive and inert artifacts, the aim of my talk is then to initiate an alternative and hopefully also more intelligent engagement with these lively tools. I hope to achieve this by implying ideas on vibrant materials, sting power, and the assemblage theory. Building upon these concepts, I shall demonstrate that stamps possess thing power, which causes them to exist beyond the role of passive objects and renders them, to a certain degree at least, animate and therefore affecting people. I'll also present the people who use these tools together with the stamps and their impressions as distinct actants who, rather than interacting on a hierarchical plane, engage in a series of relational processes within different networks or assemblages. Lastly, I'll show that the meaning of stamps and their imprints may be found in the constant flux of becoming, changing and negotiating, through distinct performative processes in which people, tools, images, things and places engaged as equals. Most authors working with these objects consider them to be involved neither in marking and identifying traded property nor in pottery decoration. This conviction derives from the fact that all the tons of pottery have been recovered at Neolithic sites in the region. No ceramic fragments with <coughs> positive prints matching those on the stamps have been so far discovered. Similarly, no ceilings of objects or clay tablets have been preserved in the region. Neolithic stamps and pintaderas from the Balkans are instead interpreted as tools for printing and impressing culturally significant images or patterns of various perishable materials such as human skin, livestock, textiles, leather, bread, and possibly walls. While other researchers argue, according to their informed guesses, in favor of just one type of use of these tools, I aim to demonstrate that different stems were used for different purposes. The glaringly obvious fact which supports this claim is that within the corpus, the modeling of bases and motifs on them varies. The bases of stems are thus sometimes modeled as conical, convex, or flat surfaces. There are also some undecorated specimens modeled as cones that have no motif on their base. These may have served as tokens rather than tools for the reproduction of geometric patterns. Similarly, it's unclear whether the objects with concave bases were actually used for stamping. The group of artifacts with ornaments interpreted as proto-writing symbols may constitute another special category. In addition to differences in the overall modeling of bases, there are also differences in the execution of motives. For example, most Greek Neolithic stamps have theirs made in high relief. The vast majority of stamps, on the other hand, have a motive executed in low relief or in the form of deep incisions in their base. Given the listed differences in the modeling of bases and motives, I argue that we can find within the analyzed corpus objects that were used as pintaderas and therefore for imprinting on human skin and others that were used as stamps reproducing images on various perishable materials. As I'll show later on in my talk, some of the analyzed artifacts may have other functions too. The starting point for the central part of this paper then is the recognition that the analyzed corpus contains artifacts with different properties and functions. 
Consequently, these different tools must have exhibited different powers. In order to better understand those, we need to look at stamps and pintaderas affordances and constraints. Without using any prior cultural knowledge, we can observe that stamps are portable objects with a decorated base and a vertical handle. The surface of the base is usually flat or sometimes slightly convex or concave. In each case, the center of gravity can be found in the lower part of the object. The artifact therefore reaches optimal stability when placed on a flat surface in such a way that the base and surface are parallel. It's crucial to note that despite being the most important constitutive element of a stamp, the motif isn't visible when the stamp is in this position. The majority of the documented tools are made of clay, although some stone specimens occur in Greece. Both materials give the object solidity and durability. The bases and the stamps are modeled in various forms and their faces bear geometrical motifs. Some handles are perforated. Since the handles are usually small and formed in a cone-like fashion, they afford optimal graspability when handled with the thumb and second finger, with the other fingers closed. If the handle is large enough, it can be grasped with all fingers forming a fist. The crucial power of these tools to reproduce, simply, quickly, and manually, a large number of almost identical copies of an original geometric motif is thus a consequence <laughs> of three physical affordances of these tools. First, the affordance to be manipulated easily when the handle is grasped. Second, the affordance to stand in the most stable position on a level plane when the base is parallel with the surface. And lastly, the affordance to reproduce positive geometric designs by imprinting an impressive negative patterns incising the faces of stamps on a number of different materials and surfaces. The vitality of stamps and pintaderas, however, resides not only in their potentialities for a particular set of actions, but also in their constraints. This can ensue from the material and physical limitations of a particular tool and from semantic and logical constraints relating to the situation in which the tool is used and the assemblages in which it resides, as well as the cultural restraints of a particular tool that were preconditioned by distinct cultural conventions. I attempted to observe some of these constraints in order to enable us to limit the number of possible materials on which people stamped and imprinted a variety of geometric patterns in the Neolithic. I thus undertook several experiments with stamp replicas to test three distinct techniques of imprinting. Stamping on unbaked unleavened bread, stamping on a piece of textile, and printing on human skin. Given that the acquired imprints were of much higher quality when softer surfaces were used, we may perhaps infer that, rather than stamping on hard surfaces, people in the Neolithic Balkans generally mark and decorated bread, their own skin, and other soft and perishable materials. That assumption is further corroborated by the presence of distinct traces on the base of some of the preserved stamps, which hint at various uses. In the Balkans, several stamps with remains of color on their base have been documented. The base of one of the tools found was severely burned, and some had heavily worn base surfaces. Given the preserved traces, as well as the physical constraints of these tools revealed during the experiment, we may infer that Neolithic stamps probably imprinted colorful geometrical patterns on human skin or stamped relief patterns in softer, perishable surfaces. Very rarely, they may also have been used for branding livestock. The vital force of these tools can be further discerned by taking a look at different assemblages in which they were embedded. Here I should mention that I understand assemblages as dynamic constellations of places, things, animals, plants and people, which are in a constant flux of becoming, changing and negotiating through their various performances and relations. Neolithic stamps in the Balkans have been discovered within buildings, in working areas and in waste pits. Just one sole specimen has generally been recovered within a particular assemblage. Perhaps the most notable exception is House A in Saskla, where three stamps with a shared motif of concentric circles were found. Given that only one stamp, or exceptionally, several stamps with an identical motif have been recovered within particular houses at different sites, we may perhaps assume that the distinct motifs produced by these tools sometimes acted as identification signs for particular family units. 
Furthermore, there are several examples of stamps that have been found in assemblages together with objects of so-called ritual function, including anthropomorphic vessels with crania, altars, figurines, stone vessels, and objects used as mnemonic devices. That, for example, applies in the case of the late Neolithic burnt building at Sita Groi, which has been interpreted as place for extracting copper ore. Special finds recovered either within or close to the building have included a stone vessel, 14 <coughs> miniature models of houses, hearts, vessel, furniture, and axes, and objects that may have been used as mnemonic devices. There are also, however, many instances where stamps have been discovered within waste pits or with a large quantity of everyday objects including courseware, stone and bone tools, grinders, querns, and loom weights. It seems extremely likely then that Neolithic stamps in the Balkans were embedded into both everyday and ritual assemblages of things, people, places, and actions. Such assemblages were composed of vibrant bodies and things of all sorts. Each element of an assemblage had its own vital force, but also contributed to the shared agency of the whole, creating new emergent properties. For example, it has been shown that similar patterns were shared by certain stamps and other types of artifacts. Synchronic vessels, figurines, and altars were all decorated with patterns of straight or curving parallel lines, chevrons, concentric circles, spirals, and meanders, or with deeply engraved or impressed dots, all of which appear on some stamps. It's very likely that such abstract patterns also occurred on perishable materials such as the products of basket green weaving. When things and decorated bodies acted together during distinct performances, for example, as part of pulsating and shifting assemblage, the graphical impact of which was further enhanced by repetitive, visually similar and vibrant patterns occurring on and being reflected from other body surfaces and materials. Within such assemblages, the vital force of stamps resided in their ability to reproduce simply and quickly a limitless number of almost identical copies of an original geometric motif on various surfaces. Such abstract images were most likely perceived as aesthetically pleasing, with the meaning either clear or ambiguous. The visual effect and material force of the images must have depended on a number of variables. Some of these included, for example, the type of surface stamped, number of motifs combined, colors used, spatial organization of motifs on the stamped surface, number of their iterations, and overall symmetry or asymmetry of the produced image. Nowadays, the, the, the right, so I was talking about the thing power of tools within different assemblages. And so um, to resume, um, within such assemblages, the vital force of stamps resided in their ability to reproduce simply and quickly a limitless number of almost identical copies of an original geometric motif on various surfaces. Such abstract images were most likely perceived as aesthetically pleasing. We, oh, right, so we said that. Sorry. Um, yes. Um, so nowadays, uh, geometric patterns and motifs produced by stamped are understood primarily as ornaments, yet in the Neolithic they may, in certain instances, have uh, acted as distinct signs. This is perhaps best illustrated by stamps with completely or almost identically executed motives. Among the most striking examples are three stone specimens with a maze motif from the Greek sites Pyrasos, Nesonis, and Philia. Other examples include specimens from Bulgarian sites in which the base has a plastically modeled chevron edge and central hollow. Such groups of stamps with identical motives can perhaps be understood like split leg figurines as signs of social networks among Neolithic villages. If that's the case, stamps with identical motifs must have taken on a secondary function in addition to their primary role of stamping distinct materials. Stamps could thus represent, either by themselves or through their imprints, various inter-settlement contexts such as alliances, obligations, exogamy, or long-distance trade. This hypothesis naturally requires further testing. If any other evidence of connections between the settlements mentioned above were found, the proposed model of stamps signifying intersettlement connections would be further corroborated. Stamps came into being through a process of transmutation. People designed and shaped them from amorphous, volatile clays probably obtained from local sources before transforming them into solid and durable ceramic tools through a process of air drying and firing. 
the tools acting back on their makers even at the earliest stage of their lives. This is best observed in the execution of motifs on stamps faces which were when clay was dried or leather hard, neatly cut or incised using a range of simple cutting tools and techniques. It is interesting to note that the execution of um, it is interesting to note that the quality of execution of a particular motif varied widely from accurate through to the negligent. Um, sorry, it seems like. Right. It is precisely the latter group of poorly executed motives that speaks loudly of the vitality of materials and their relational dynamics with the maker. The making of a stem was never neatly and hierarchically divided into an immaterial plan that existed in the head of the maker on the one hand and its hierarchically dependent materialized counterpart in the form of stamp on the other. Rather, it was a processual dialogue between the material and the maker, best illustrated by the execution of distinct motive in which the design of an object grew organically from the responses of the material. Once executed, a particular stamp could also reveal its animacy through its capacity to enchant a viewer. Greek specimens, for example, were made from highly valued, exotic, and very durable colored stones and were carved with great effort, skill and time from drilled and polished stones, an undertaking that probably requires specialized knowledge, which was not the case with clay specimens. The thin power of stone stamps realized itself in what Alfred Jell calls magical quality and which meant that they could, through their technical virtuosity, catch and hold observers' attention and enchant them. This was, of course, in stark contrast with the majority of ceramic stamps, which were rather inconspicuous objects. Small, plain, and with the motif hidden when standing on their base, they may have been overlooked within Neolithic houses. Yet when used for stamping, their hidden force was suddenly unveiled and came to the fore. By imprinting geometrical patterns, they created a tangible connection between the user and the surface on which the images were imprinted. The geometrical abstract patterns covered bodies and things with new layers of meaning that could be associated with their bearers either temporarily or more permanently. While the performative action of stamping would have taken place either in private or in public, it could always be understood as a process of negotiation between iteration and change. On the one hand, the stamps themselves, as tools, embodied the idea of reproducing abstract images. On the other hand, they also allowed for much creative freedom through a selection of different colors and spatial arrangement of motifs, for example. While used in different performative actions, stamps therefore not only enable continuity, but also allow the emergence of change through the processual dialogue between the tool handler, the motif, and the stamp surface. Given that stamp stamps have heavily worn bases, stamping must have been, at least in certain instances, a performance that recurs over an extended period of time. Some tools may even have passed from one generation to another until they became damaged or were so worn out that they couldn't serve their original purpose. Being used for longer periods would have imbued them with greater power too, by creating a denser mesh of connections between the tools and numerous other things, animals, plants, people and places. Some of the thin power of stamps is also revealed in the fact that a number of tools had per perforated handles and could have been worn in contact with owner's body. In these circumstances, the tool's powers rubbed on the owner and the owner's powers on the tool. At the very end of their life, some stamps were formally deposited in a grave, hoard, or a distinct settlement structure. The great majority, however, were discarded in refuse pits or lay lost and forgotten in corners of houses, in working spaces, or between buildings until they were eventually rediscovered by archaeologists. Coming to an end of my talk, I wish to emphasize once again that the corpus um, comprises diverse objects, including pintaderas for decorating the human body, stamps for marking different soft surfaces, and branding tools for marking cattle. Despite substantial differences in their size, materials, and motives, all artifacts share several common denominators in terms of their material properties. These define them as tools intended to transfer distinct motives onto various surfaces. <coughs> On the other hand, the wide variations stem from the distinct assemblages and performances associated with certain tools. In my concluding thought, I'd like to highlight a diametrically opposed perception of stamps and their imprints as it once was during the Neolithic and as it is today. 
the attention of a Neolithic man must have been primarily focused on a dynamic and creative process of reducing visually and perhaps sometimes even formally coded imprints with stamps. The situation today, however, is diametri diametrically opposite. Since no imprints have been preserved, our minds have a tendency to examine and analyze primarily the Neolithic tools on their own. Meanwhile, their final product, the enigmatic and unpreserved imprints, lingers somewhere in the background of our minds where their existence in the past is acknowledged, yet not fully accessible anymore. It is for this very reason, namely the absence of imprints, that we must come to terms with the fact that much about Neolithic stamps and pintaderas cannot be known. I hope, however, that by focusing on what is present and by using specific theoretical concepts, I have successfully demonstrated that we can still discern many of the layers of meaning associated with these tools. Thank you. Thank you.